CCL's executive director was on vacation this week, so I'm hosting today's call. You know, like many of you, a couple days ago, I got to see the long-awaited episode of National Geographic's climate change team called Years of Living Dangerously. It features CCL volunteer Jay Butera's incredible work leading to a bipartisan climate caucus in the House. You know, it just really touched me to see the difference he's made and to see it right there uh, in meetings on camera. So, you know, Jay would be the first to say he hasn't done it alone, and it's really true. Your work in the field backs him up and makes it possible. But Jay's commitment and persistence has been key. So if you haven't seen the show yet, I hope you'll find time to watch it. But you might be wondering, like, how did Jay manage to persist in getting Republican and Democrat uh, Congress people in the room together to talk about climate? Well, a few years ago, Jay shared with us a statement he created for himself about his purpose. And he says that out loud to himself every morning. I keep it in my planning book, and I read it to myself sometimes. And I want to share it with you now to start the call. This is what he tells himself every morning. Why I act on climate. I believe that I can have a major impact on the fate of our planet if I work tirelessly toward climate solutions. Think big, oh, no, not Why is this not I believe that bold actions by a few brave people can change the course of history and stabilize Earth's climate. I believe I am one of those people. Doing this will not be easy or comfortable, but it is definitely possible. And since it is possible, I must try. I will not give up. That's just thank you, Jay. That's amazing. Uh -oh. And then I want to especially welcome the new groups and all the people who are joining us for the first time and tell you a little bit about the kind of organization we are. So Jay Butera is one example. Our volunteers aren't all able to give the kind of time that Jay has, but uh, really everyone gives generously of whatever they have as far as their lives permit. So CCLers are ordinary citizens who've decided to do something extraordinary with their lives and do it together with others in the community. We're people who have decided to reach inside ourselves to be the best citizens of our democracy that we can be so that we can reach our elected officials and help them rise to be their best selves, bringing people together really around our common humanity and the common threat that we face. And I think we're needed now more than ever to do this. You know, here in the U.S., the election no doubt has caused uh, some, maybe many people to turn away from our federal government. But we're people who've decided we can't afford to do that. And instead, we've seen a great outpouring from our membership. For example, 294 volunteers went to Congress at their own expense for our Congressional Education Day a week after the election and met with 197 Republican offices, 142 Democratic ones, and two independents in order to respectfully make it clear that we still want climate action and to continue building our relationships with them. So welcome, new members. Uh, there's many ways for you to engage in the work. And as you figure out the role you want to play in your local group or in the national organization, there's one more thing I want you to know about us. We encourage you to have fun and to let yourself grow and try new things. Like, no matter what we feel about the predicaments of our climate and our democracy, we believe in having fun together and really in experiencing the joy that comes from stretching ourselves to take meaningful action together. So my advice to you uh, is to start with those things that will light you up. Maybe that's writing your first letter to the editor or holding a house party for your friends to learn about CCL or calling your members of Congress. Our introductory call on Wednesday evening and our two-part online uh, climate advocate training will help you get started charting your path with us. Okay, so our speakers today are none other than Jay Butera and Sam Daly-Harris. Uh, I'll also share a few highlights from the month, go over the suggested actions for the U.S. and Canada, and our executive director, Mark Reynolds, will take a few minutes out of his vacation to share a few thoughts with us, uh, including on some of the recent news out on the EPA. So now I'm going to introduce our speakers. Well, I think I've already pretty much introduced Jay Butera. Um, but in a nutshell, Jay's a CCL volunteer who gave himself a giant project, creation of the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus. Sam Daly-Harris is the founder of an organization called Results, which pioneered the methodology that CCL uses to empower citizens to effectively work in Congress, and he's been a key advisor to us. He's the author of Reclaiming Our Democracy, which is a practical and inspiring description of the method that's used by both CC uh, CCL and Results. 
So Sam and Jay are each going to share how they work with Congress and then give us their advice on two scenarios that I've given them based on actual situations. And then if you're online, you can type your questions or comments into the chat and we'll get to as many of those as we have time for. If, uh, just a caveat, if you're asking advice about a specific member of Congress, please don't identify him or her by name. Okay, so Sam, are you there? Hi there. Thank you, Madeline. Hi, everyone. I'm really, really excited to be with you. Uh, I know it's a tough time for some in our country, and you give me hope. Uh, and so I'm just thrilled to be with you. Uh, Jay Butera and I did a webinar four weeks ago on creating champions in Congress. The description of the webinar went like this. It seems to happen all the time. I talk to a volunteer in any organization, and they either say, my member of Congress is so good, I don't have to meet with her. Or, my member of Congress is so bad, what's the point in meeting with him? Say what? In this section, I'll briefly outline the champion scale, tell a story about how CCL Director of Communications Steve Valk and his results team moved a congressman up the champion scale 30 years ago after the congressman voted against famine aid for starving Ethiopians. Then Jay will describe his strategy, especially working with Republicans. Now the champion scale. I think we can all agree that the farthest you can get from champion is being opposed. A member of Congress who's opposed might say, I don't support that, or my constituents wouldn't support that, or what you're talking about isn't even a problem, or I agree it's a problem, but I don't support your solution. The next level from opposed is neutral. Someone who's neutral might say, I need more information, or can you explain it to me more fully, or could you give me some materials to read so I can be, make a more informed decision? The next level from neutral is a supporter. The supporter might say, I'll co-sponsor that, or I think that's a good solution and I can get behind it. The next level from supporter is advocate. An advocate might say, now that I'm a co-sponsor, I think it's important to build support for this. I'm gonna to talk to other members of Congress about supporting it. Or they might say, do you think you could help me draft an op-ed for my paper so we can educate our constituents? The next level from advocate is a leader and a spokesperson. A leader and spokesperson might be the lead sponsor of a bill or an initiator of a climate solutions caucus. The final level is champion. And I don't like it when groups cheapen the term champion and call anyone who does anything good a champion. For me, a champion is someone who's so passionate that they're out in front of CCL and pushing CCL to catch up. They might say something like, I've arranged for five of my Republican colleagues and five of my Democratic colleagues to host a town hall meeting on carbon fee and dividend, and I need your help finding speakers in all 10 congressional districts. Or they might say, I'm gathering Republican signatures on a letter to President-elect Trump asking for a meeting to discuss carbon fee and dividend, and I'd like your help in getting congressional Republican signers and er editorials urging the President-elect to meet with us. Those are the, uh, uh, the levels of the champion scale. So here's Steve Valk's story from my book, Reclaiming Our Democracy. And this is a story of moving an opponent up the champion scale. Steve's a member of Congress was one of very few who voted against famine aid for starving Ethiopians in 1985. He said, if watching your member of Congress was like a sport, they'd be sitting in the stands with bags over their heads. They were so ashamed to have him for a congressman. But at the suggestion of results staff, they began to shift their thinking. There was this prayer that another volunteer had written for his member of Congress in Houston, Texas, two years earlier. They adapted it for their congressman, Pat Swindoll. It went like this, quote, thank you God for Pat Swindoll. We know he's a good man who wants to do right in the world. We know he struggles with the same problems we do, closing our hearts to those who don't agree with us. There are no thoughts or feelings that he's had and that we haven't had and vice versa. We pray for all of us to have compassion for people in our country and far away, for rich and poor. We pray that Pat and we will be less frightened of each other. We pray our focus will be more to love and appreciate him 
and to less to change him. Help us remember that sharing love with the world is the highest contribution we can make and will lead to children being fed and the planet surviving. Forgive our righteousness and anger. Open our hearts and minds to find the next expression of love for Pat that he can receive." End of quote. Well, when Steve shared this on a results conference call years ago, he said they would read the prayer at each meeting, and at first they'd end the prayer going, yeah, right, not likely. But eventually they started to take it to heart. They started to meet the congressman with a handshake and a smile instead of a scowl, and a story of how one intervention or another could save millions of lives. Two years later, they piled into the congressman's office, showed him a video on microcredit, and asked him to co-sponsor the legislation. The congressman said yes, and asked their help in writing an op-ed for his weekly column to help educate his constituents. Steve concluded his story like this, quote, I was now ghostwriting for a man who two years earlier voted against famine aid for Ethiopia. We were the only lobby in Georgia who could get conservative Congressman Pat Swindoll and liberal Congressman John Lewis to co-sponsor the same bill. That experience changed me. I now see that everyone has the potential to do the right thing if given the opportunity. It's refreshing to see people as possibilities rather than as obstacles. Let me turn it over to Jay Batera to share with us right now. Jay? Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, the question that I want to explore uh, with all of you today is how do we go about uh, building the kind of re congressional relationships that move our representatives and senators up this ladder of engagement, uh, up the champion scale that Sam just went through? And um, what is it that will move them uh, from wherever they are right now to the next level, from opposed to neutral, from neutral toward advocate, from advocate to champion? Uh, and I've been thinking a lot about this, and I've been trying to uh, sort of look at some of our best relationships in CCL and, and try and look for common threads. What do they all have in common? Uh, and so there's a lot of common denominators uh, that run through those relationships, I found. But I wanted to focus today uh, on three uh, and zero in on, on three uh, particular aspects of some growing great relationships that we see in CCL. And so uh, the first aspect that I've observed is frequent and continuous contact with the member and the uh, congressional staff. Uh, the second is uh, to become useful. Uh, our CCL uh, volunteers uh, become particularly useful. And thirdly is a concept I call recalibration and recalibrating often, and we're going to talk about that. So uh, when we talk about frequent contact, it feels to me like we are fighting gravity with our relationships. Relationships have a tendency to diminish over time. So if we are not moving a relationship forward and advancing it, it will be slipping back. So when we're fighting that gravity, um, I think we have to always keep that in mind. Uh, the average congressional staffer, uh, as you know, is handling five or six issue categories, many totally unrelated to ours. They take eight to 10 to 13 meetings per day. So that means that if you meet with them today and then you manage to get them interested in your issue, by next month they will have had 200 other meetings uh, on five separate categories. And do you think our issue is gonna be on the front burner by then? No, I don't think so. Uh, things tend to drift toward the back burner. Now the other reason for frequency of contact is studies show that Frequency of contact builds trust. Literally just seeing a person visually on a regular basis creates a rapport and creates trust. You know, if you have an acquaintance uh, who you see once a year, uh, what kind of relationship do you think that will be? And uh, probably pretty superficial. And when it comes time that you need something, you have something to ask for, uh, is that a person that you could call who you've seen once a year? Probably not. 
So I want to talk about some examples of frequency of contact. Uh, you saw one in the Years of Living Dangerously episode with Congressman Lee Zeldin in New York's first district. The, um, you saw the congressman in the episode actually take his first public step forward on climate change. And Congressman Zeldin agreed in that episode to join the Climate Solutions Caucus. Now, the thing is, that didn't just happen uh, with a once a year meeting. Uh, Ashley Hunt Martirano and the great uh, crew in uh, CCL crew in the district there, they had met with the congressman, if you listen to the episode, 15 times uh, prior to that in the prior year. And, and that doesn't even include their phone calls, emails, office drop-offs, and all kinds of other contacts that they just kept going. Uh, and I, I want to mention that you don't have to go to Washington every month to have these frequent contacts. There is a, a chapter in Wisconsin, uh, and maybe others uh, that you know about, have a keep a standing monthly meeting in district with the uh, district staff for their uh, member uh, of Congress. And I think that's that's really great. Another chapter has a commitment to attend every town hall meeting that the congressman uh, holds. And you know what happened with that frequency of contact? They became uh, on first name basis just by going to all those town hall meetings and interacting. The, um, you know, I have uh, offices in DC where, where I'll visit them two or three times a month. And if I skip a few weeks, uh, they're asking me, uh, you know, where have you been? And I, I think that becomes, to me, a sign of a good relationship when they miss you if you're not there. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, you're probably thinking, how can we have this much contact and uh, not have them get tired of us? And, and that brings me exactly to the next point, and that is we have to make ourselves useful. So I like to say, don't ask what the member can do for you. Let's ask what we can do for the member. You know, you win friends by helping others get what they want and not asking them to do what we want. So this involves sort of stop selling our concept a little bit and let's focus on, on what's important to this member and to this staffer. It may be helping them with an issue that's totally unrelated to ours. And that helps to build goodwill and, and helps to solidify uh, your relationship. Uh, there was a member uh, who the staff called me one day and said, we are thinking about doing some outreach for the Climate Solutions Caucus, and we would like to uh, know what you think about this other member of Congress and what you know about them. And my reaction to that was, give me 48 hours, and I, and I worked and put together a 14-page report for them covering every aspect I knew that could help them approach this member of Congress. And do you know that staffer still mentions that to me as being particularly helpful to him and his boss? So that's sort of what I mean about trying to become part of the team and be helpful. And it doesn't mean always layering on our own policy and giving them more and more reports on our own policy. Help them where they need help and, and you'll be appreciated for it. Uh, another way you can be helpful is by bringing new voices to the table. There's, um, there's a chapter in Wisconsin that has put together this leader's letter with, and this is incredible, I think it's a new CCL record, they have 150 small to medium businesses, clergy, and elected officials who've signed a letter asking their member of Congress to act on climate change. Now, that may seem self-serving to you, but it goes both ways. If you're helping to keep the member in touch with their district, it's a, of huge importance to them. So that brings me to the next point that I want to talk to you about, and that is recalibration. We hit a lot of roadblocks in this work. Uh, there is no one set of sequences uh, that will actually keep a relationship advance, advancing forward. So I like to say when we hit a roadblock, we need to recalibrate assess the angle of approach that we are taking with this member of Congress and come up with a new plan. You know, I often hear of people, and we've all been there, we're hitting a brick wall. And uh, I need to tell you that sometimes that can be the point of inspiration. 
all of the best things I have done for CCL, I think, have come out of those moments of despair. When it seems like I'm hitting an unsurmountable brick wall, uh, the constituent comment forms that uh, we use to take cons constituent comments into the member of Congress, that evolved in a parking lot in Miami, me sitting in a rental car, banging my head against the steering wheel because I, I was talking to all these worried citizens uh, about who are worried about sea level rise and climate change and couldn't figure out how we take that message to Washington. Uh, the constituent comment form was done on my laptop in the car, printed at a FedEx Kinko's and, and started the next day with it. Uh, so, uh, you know, the leader's letter, uh, that concept was evolved at a moment of impasse after a year of meetings with a Republican member who just couldn't uh, I couldn't get them to pay attention to sea level rise and climate impacts. I wondered what it would take. And I thought it would take bringing mayors and chambers of commerce and business leaders to them. Uh, so that evolved, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. And even the Climate Solutions Caucus is an idea uh, that evolved when I had hit a brick wall and we just had to find a new route to break the gridlock and bring parties together. So if you hit a moment of impasse, don't think of it as a dead end, you know, because it just might be a moment of inspiration that we've all been waiting for. And the last thing I want to mention is always successful relationships. The underlying factor is that we never give up. This is not a sprint. It's not even a marathon. Think of what we are doing. I think of it as a long distance hike. Think Appalachian Trail, Georgia to Maine. And so, you know, we never know what's around the next bend, uh, but when we get there, we will figure out how to deal with it and how to move forward and move, just keep moving over these hills and around the next bend toward the destination that we're all working for. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jay and Sam. Let's do one of those scenarios now. Uh, so here it is. You could call it a Republican member of Congress backs off. And it's uh, in this affluent suburban district, the group's established a good connection with the aide in DC. He helped arrange the first face-to-face -face meeting with the congressman in 2015. And at that meeting, the congressman asked great questions and was very engaged. But when they had a second meeting uh, last June, he expressed a lot more distrust in government and concern that a carbon fee would be a drag on the economy. And our Remy, our Remy study didn't seem to alter his opinion on that. So they delivered a pile of constituent comment forms at that meeting and the aide uh, liked that and was also very interested in an op-ed by the CEO of a major corporation expressing support for a price on carbon. The group, uh, to tell you a little about that, has six to eight active members and feels like they're spread thin, and they want to carefully target their efforts to the most effective thing. They had one letter to the editor published this year. In the last year, they've had the one face-to-face -face meeting and two meetings with DC staff, but the district staff is not interested in talking to them anymore about carbon fee and dividend. So what advice would you two give this group? Great, thanks. Uh, I'll jump in on that first. You said the congressman expressed more just trust in government and concern that a carbon fee would be a drag on the economy. I'd ask questions like this. Is there a major university in the district or community college? Could you enroll the dean or a professor of the business school or environmental studies or the president of the university to come in to a meeting with the congressman that you'd prepared for? Is the congressman active in his synagogue, temple or church? Would he listen to clergy leaders in his community? What are the congressman's pet issues, things he cares about the most? You mentioned having one letter to the editor published. I'd urge you to consider taking the monthly action after each conference call, and then having someone bring an article that either relates to an issue he cares about and acknowledgement and his support by name in letters to the editor, thanking him and encouraging him to bring the same level of leadership to the climate issue. If you get a letter or two each month mentioning him by name in a positive light, the local aide will want to meet with you, and so will the congressman. Jay, do you have some other ideas? 
Well, I would zero in, Sam, on the uh, the mention of the op-ed by a CEO uh, that that the member had seen that caught their interest or the staff had seen. And I would take that as a sign that they are very interested in the opinion of business. And I would go from there to try and identify who are the most influential businesses who have a stake in that very district, connect with the CEOs of those businesses, see if they would like to meet with the member of Congress and then ask the member of Congress if, if he would or she would like to meet with those CEOs and try and broker a conversation that brings that goes beyond the op-ed uh, that the congressman had read, but and and brings them to get him together with uh, business interests right in his own district. Great. Great. Thank you. That's going to be some really helpful advice. I think actually to a number of groups in that situation. Uh, let's look at the second scenario, and I'll just mention that I'm not sure we'll have any time for stuff in the chat, uh, but we might manage one or two. We'll see. So the second one we would call a supportive de Democrat, and this Democrat's in a rural district with three CCL chapters that have been meeting him with him for the last four to five years. Uh, in 2016, they had three meetings in D.C. with the aide and two meetings in district, including a face-to-face -face with the congressman. And the congressman's moved from feeling burned by his previous support of cap and trade in 2009 to increasingly supportive of carbon fee and dividend. His office was instrumental in hosting a briefing by a legislative director this summer for members of a House caucus that he belongs to. Uh, and this Democratic congressman would like to join the Climate Solutions Caucus, but hasn't found a Republican to partner with. The CCL members there understand that, that uh, CCL doesn't wish them to directly contact Republican members of Congress on his behalf, and they aren't sure what to do next about that. Uh, these three CCL groups do jointly generate a lot of media in the district and mention him favorably in some of them, uh, probably 100 pieces during the last year and hundreds of letters from constituents. What's your advice to them? Well, I'd start out with, wow. Probably a hundred media pieces during the last year. Wow. First of all, I'd recommend that if you get a piece in the media, you send it to the DC aide and call to make sure he or she saw it. But with a hundred pieces a year, that would be eight calls a month. Bad idea. I re recommend that the liaison from each of the three groups schedule a joint monthly conference call with the DC aide to go over what you're accomplishing back in the district, updates on CCL's work, getting ideas from, what, from the aide on what the congressman needs and what the next best steps would be. I'd also look for more, more ways to acknowledge the congressman publicly. But could more letters to the editor acknowledge him by name? Could he be invited to sign an op-ed on carbon fee and dividend that you might draft and help place in the newspaper? Could you pitch an editorial acknowledging work so far and urging him to take the next steps. Could you work with other groups locally to host a lecture by the congressman on climate change, get a great turnout, and perhaps give him a reward for the briefing he helped organize with his caucus in the Capitol? In all of this, I'm looking to build an even deeper relationship with your group, so you might encourage him to look harder for ways he can move from supporter to advocate to leader. I'm looking for what you can do to help make climate change a career issue for him, something he'd like to uh, be known for. Jay? Well, I, I would zero in on the uh, caucus and helping to find a Republican there. And, and I would say prepare uh, this member uh, to meet his Republican. And by that, I mean, uh, give him an idea of what we are seeing as the important points in Republican offices, so this Democratic member uh, can can understand what uh, a Republican counterpart may be thinking and looking for. We've got tremendous data that Danny Richter has prepared for us that we used in the November Education Day uh, that that breaks down what uh, you know the most uh, important issues about our policy uh, with each party. And, and I think that's really important to help this uh, Democrat reach across the aisle and, and find common ground. Uh, and then the other thing I would do is maybe look for issues 
uh, where, where this Democratic member might be connected with uh, Republicans and whether they're on the same committee or, or working on a bipartisan bill somewhere and, and see if you can suggest uh, some of those Republicans as being potential cooperative candidates to bring into the caucus. And, and those conversations across the aisle will be really helpful in Congress uh, wherever they lead. Great. Uh, really, really helpful advice, both of you. Um, and, you know, I learn so much every time I'm around you. I just really want to thank you for being with us today. Uh, I think we'll have to skip the chat, plus I don't see a lot in it right now. Uh, but thank you so much for the time that you gave us this morning and, and really everything you do everywhere. <laughs> you two are both a force for good. Um, and for anyone who wants more, uh, you might check out the Citizens Climate University program that Sam and, and Jay recently did for us on this topic. And uh, Ricky and I are thinking that we'll be bringing them back periodically so they can do more coaching and, uh, and helping us out with our particular issues and questions. So thanks, you guys. Okay, so uh, moving on to the last part of our call, uh, just some updates on what we've been hearing. It's really been an amazing month. I've seen person after person dig deep and rededicate themselves to moving things forward. And I'm just going to give you a few bullet points. So uh, CCL in the news. We were cited on the Today Show in a USA Today op-ed and in stories in The Guardian, e, e News, Think Progress, and the Associated Press. By the way, year to date, you've reported 2,236 letters to the editor and 365 op-eds. In the fundraising area, well, first of all, for those of you who just joined, you probably noticed that we don't have any membership dues. Your time building, uh, that's spent building political will in your community is more important to us. But many of our members do choose to donate, and we just held our biggest fundraiser of the year, our Giving Tuesday campaign. It surpassed our wildest dreams. The original Women Who Will matching gift pool was 150000 and we met that goal even before we hit Giving Tuesday with all your donations. Then an anonymous family foundation uh, added to the matching gift pool, uh, bringing that up to 250000 and you race past that goal, and we ended up with a total of $449,735. And when you add in the matching gifts, we ended up with $699,735. Wow. <laughs> and the donations are still coming in. So it is just unbelievably helpful to end the year like this. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, okay, so internationally... CCL Canada held their national conference November 26th to 29th, and 53 uh, CCL volunteers lobbied on Parliament Hill for improvements to Canada's national carbon pricing policy. I'm so glad Canada's moving ahead like that. Uh, and they met with 40 members of Parliament and one senator in face-to-face -face meetings, as well as the staff of six parliamentarians. CCL Australia uh, also just had uh, what was their second national conference with two days of lobbying and held 24 meetings with members of parliament. And they plan to return in March with twice as many citizen volunteers. So you are on your way, Australia. Uh, in the US, CCL Legislative Director Danny Richter summed up our experience lobbying 60% of Congress the week after the US election uh, this way. Danny said, our volunteers left more campaign, and we took climate off the back burner as members of Congress consider their legislative agenda for the next legislative session. Uh, and then uh, there's years of living dangerously. Um, I don't know how many house parties we had yet, um, but as you can imagine, emails are coming in from people who watch the show. And I just have to quote this one uh, that I saw. Uh, the writer said, I just watched your show on National Geographic and I was in shock. I am a 28-year-old Republican school teacher and football coach in Central Kentucky. I'm a nature lover and as Southern as it gets. However, I had no idea that so many members of the GOP talk about climate change like something that hasn't been proven. I want to know what I can do to help. I'm already planning on getting in touch with my congressman. Lastly, I would really like to thank you for what you're doing. I love that email. All right, so speaking of helping, here are this month's recommended actions. 
for the US, one, write letters to the editor. And remember that we have an online tool that lists all the papers in a 30 mile radius of your zip code. Two, plan a welcome or orientation event for new members in the next two months. And then for Canada, the suggested actions are, one, ask friends to donate to Citizens Climate Lobby Canada, and two, send your member of parliament a Christmas card. There's a special action though in uh, Ontario, Canada only, which is to leave comments for the province of Ontario regarding your province's carbon pricing policy and using the link provided. Okay, so uh, next let's get our executive director, Mark Reynolds, unmuted. Mark, are you there? What would you like to tell us about moving forward next year? Well, two things. Can you hear me, Madeline? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. Uh, first of all, <laughs> it's a pleasure being on the call from this end. Let me just say that uh, it's so inspiring to watch you and everybody do this. Uh, it's very fulfilling for me uh, just to be able to be a participant on the call. I'm kind of blown away and uh, bear with me a little bit. Um, so there's two things I want to say. One, time, one is that um, when things get a little bit chaotic like this and that um, you know, the news is rough, it's important to remember that we have a lot of friends out there who are working hard also. So we have big fr friends at Big Green, we have friends at 350 and other social justice organizations, and we have th friends in the conservative think tanks that we all work very closely with. So Fred Krupp from EDF just came back from a big meeting with the Pope and 30 ma major corporations talking about the support for the Paris Agreement and also putting a price on carbon. So it's important to know that our friends are doing that. I sent a note to our very good friend, May, May Bouvet, the executive director of 350, about the work they've been doing on the pipeline in North Dakota. And she was extremely appreciative of that. And then also, um, you know, our conservative organizations we work with, the SCAN and Bob Inglis's organization, Republican, R Street are working very hard. And I strongly recommend that all of you regularly read anything that comes out of Jerry Tyler's shop, the SCAN, and they're simply the best thinkers in Washington, DC, I believe. Okay, here's what I wanna say. We saw going into this administration that we were going to lose the clean power plan as a lever. So, you know, uh, that, that had nothing to do with, with who was going to be the EPA administrator. We were losing one of the key levers that helped us create leverage. So when you lose a lever, you have to add a lever. One of the things we have always done is encouraged people who could take activities in state to do so. We haven't been able to provide any support, but we've said, go ahead and do that. What we are going to do is find a way to provide additional support to states. So if you're in a state where you're able to push for a transparent price on carbon, I just want you to know the organization will figure out how to provide additional support this year. I'm not saying to change anything you're doing. 100% of our work is still on a federal basis. Nobody is in a better position than we are than to work with the Republican Congress. So all the, all the goodwill we will build up with the Curbellos and the Ileana Deutsch Leitmans of the, of the world. We want to continue to do that, but one of the things we'll do in the absence of the Clean Power Plan as a lever, we will provide additional support in the states, and very early on next year, we'll begin to show you more of what that is, including um, the people from Carbon Washington will be our guest speakers in January to talk about what are the lessons learned in states. So thank you all very much. Again, it's incredibly inspiring to be on the call as a participant, and I'll turn it back to you, Madeline. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. You know, the call feels more complete now that you've been a little bit leaky on it. <laughs> so uh, to close off the call, I just want to end by sharing a few of the comments that people wrote to us when they donated on Giving Tuesday, and then we'll unmute everyone so you can wave and say goodbye. Um, uh, I'm going to start with the one that really got to me as a former teacher. Uh, this person wrote, commented with her donation, I'm an elementary school librarian and I'm donating on behalf of all the children who sit in front of me each week. I'm responsible for them and for their well-being. Leaving them a healthy planet is part of that. And from a newcomer uh, commented, thank you for everything you do. I just listened to the weekly call for new volunteers and I am ready to get started. And another donor wrote, it's now more important than ever to have organizations such as yours involved in advocating for a sustainable future for our planet and children. Thank you for all you do, and please don't ever quit. Okay, I won't. Uh, and then the last one, short and sweet, CCL is the best thing that I am involved in. <laughs> 
Okay, that's it for today. 